everybody, and welcome to Life is a Gamble. My guest today is Nicholas Forty, and Nick is the corporate pastry chef for the West Coast of Tao Group. Uh, and so, Nick, thank you very much for being here with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. My uh, my first podcast, so very exciting, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Oh, a- absolutely. So, um, I, the the story um, that first caught my attention um, was you getting out of pa- pastry school and going to the only three three Michelin star uh, restaurant in Nevada at that time and somehow talking your way in. But um, be, but before we get to that, um, and, and the reason that that interests me is because um, sort of the theme of this show is that um, we take big, or we are faced with big gambles in our life, and we either choose to take a risk or not, and how that affects us going forward. But before we get to um, uh, Joel Robichon, I, I wanted to go back to the beginning and find out what. How did you get involved in in basically making cake? Right. Yeah, I mean, so so even from an early age, I was interested in baking. Um, I have pictures when I was, I think, like ten years old, dressing up as a pastry chef for Halloween, um, and I really grew up watching Cake Boss watching him build these crazy cakes and um, started making cakes at home with my mom. And we would, we would sell them on the weekends to our family and friends. But at the time we would sell like a three tier wedding cake for $40. So we didn't really know what we were doing, um, but we were enjoying it. And, uh, and it just kind of slowly turned into um, a a really big hobby of mine. And then of course later became my profession. Um, But the funny thing is, is that throughout um, high school and then I went to college, I went to kines- I went for kinesiology, which is like totally on the opposite ends of baking. You know, it's all about uh, human body movement. And uh, I wanted to be a personal trainer and all of this stuff. Um, so kind of talking uh, about that big life gamble was being in college, going for kinesiology, um, also working as a cake decorator at the time. And, uh, and eventually having to pick one or the other because it, it was a lot for me to do both. Sure. And, and um, I mean, that when you say a uh, uh, trainer, a sports trainer, I mean, you're not talking about a, a guy at uh, LA Fitness that you, you're talking about like for a sports team or something? No, no, no. Uh, so I, I played lacrosse my whole uh, middle school and high school. And at the time I had a personal trainer. Uh, Byron Ross. So I I grew up with him and I wanted to be like him, like a personal trainer, which is why I went to school for it. Uh, Um, Because I I was always in the gym. I was always playing lacrosse, but then I was baking at, you know, at the same time. So it was just like a weird combo that I had going on. Um, And yeah, I mean, it came down to a point and I told my parents, like, I think I'm going to drop out of college and be like a cake decorator. So it's, it's really like a kind of a funny story. I'm sure they weren't so happy at the time, but, um, <laughs> you know, it seems to be going all right. So, well, Hey, you know, I told my parents I was going to be uh, an actor and, and, and a professional gambler. So you can imagine how that, uh, went over with, <laughs> with them. <laughs> uh, but, uh, obviously I'm sure they supported you, uh, in your decision. And, and so, uh, you went to school in Chicago. Is that right? Yep. So um, I was working a couple couple little pastry jobs in Vegas, and I decided that I really wanted to go to pastry school, um, not only to have it under my resume, but to really get a, a good basic um, French pastry knowledge. So uh, so I went to the French pastry school in Chicago. I had a ton of um, famous French chefs teaching there, um, made a lot of connections. It was the only school where we only did pastry. So I had no interest in savory. I didn't want to touch a, a frying pan or make anything like that. Like I, I only wanted to do pastry. And this was the best school in the country. So um, my parents helped me go out there. I lived there for about seven months. Um, but the, the, yeah. funny, the funny story about Joel Robichon is that when I got accepted to 
go to the school, my parents said, all right, well, we'll take you out to dinner anywhere you want to go, like as a celebration. And I said, all right, let's go to Joel Robichon. And <laughs> um, which is funny because it's extremely expensive. You know, it was it's about a thousand dollars per person when you go there for dinner. Um, and I remember taking a tour through the back uh, during dinner and the guy that was giving us a tour he, um, I turned to him and I said, I'm going to work here when I come back from pastry school. And I'm sure he was like, oh, okay, kid, like, <laughs> you know, whatever you say. Um, and it's funny because when I came back from pastry school and I went there, he was still there and I would, and he remembered me. So it was kind of a cool moment of like, you know, that, that was my dream. Um, before I went to pastry school was always to work in a Michelin restaurant and, and get that fine dining experience. So um, it's exactly what I was like able to get. So which is pretty cool. And how, how did you do that? I mean, w did you just suit up, show up and say, Hey, I want a job. At, at first I did, I, I put on a nice tie and I, and I walked up with a portfolio of cakes, like birthday cakes. And at the time that's really what I had. Um, but what I, what I had on was on the resume, I had the French pastry school and luckily the executive pastry chef of Robichon um, was actually one of the people, one of the first people that went to the school. So we had that in common. Um, and then back then we did stages. So you had to go and do like a tryout um, so they could see how you worked. We don't do that as much nowadays with stages, but really? so I, was, I was able to go spend three, four hours making some stuff. So they see how you work. And uh, I walked back to my car in the, in the parking lot and I had gotten a call like right then that, that I was able to get the job. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. Um, so so staging is not a thing anymore? It's not a thing. There's a lot of um, a lot of laws on it because it's unpaid. So you're pretty much just there. As a slave, um, yeah. <laughs> as a slave doing uh, just random stuff for them. But um, I think it's super important. I wish we did it more often because then you really see before you hire someone uh, how they work and um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of a thing in the past, but that's how I started. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Chicago must have been quite a change if you were there at all in the winter uh, growing up in Vegas. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it was something I wasn't used to. And I lived out there by myself, too. Um, my wife was coming out there to visit. But, uh, yeah, riding the, the subway every day. And uh, something I'm really not used to is riding the, the public transportation because we don't have that as much in Vegas. But um, the funny thing is making these big uh, show pieces and croquembouches and all this stuff and then having to take them back on the train back to my apartment. And people are looking at you like you're like you're crazy. You know, they've never seen anything like that. Why, why are you taking them home? <laughs> you know, because you, you spend all day working on them and they tell them like they tell you take them home and enjoy them with your family and. So I would have to take them back to my apartment, but I would ride the train. So, you know, I'm just there with like a three foot tall croque and bouche and uh, <laughs> sugar roses and people. Are, it's not and then sitting see. alone in an apartment in Chicago. <laughs> Pretty much like just eating, eating it, it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, did you gain 50 pounds or? No, I'm, I mean, I, was, I had a good routine. It was just like uh, school, gym, and then you know, back to it. So, you know, when you're, when you're just living there by yourself, you get into a good routine and, um, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. And, uh, and I made a lot of great connections that, that have helped me throughout my career there. So what was it like then at, at Joel Robichon? How, how long did you stay there? I was there for two years. Um, I started as a pastry cook and then, uh, I got promoted to a sous chef and, um, I mean, it's very good. It's very structured. You you come in and you you do the same thing every day, but you do it perfectly, and um, and it's I think it's a a really great place to learn the techniques and to learn um, the professionalism that you need in a kitchen because they don't they don't put up with uh, a lot there. You know, you have to be very professional. You have to be very uh, robotic in your in what you do. Um, but after two years, I felt like I had I had gained what I needed, and I was ready. You know, I have I have a creative bug in me, and I and I love to to practice and do other things. So it's you know after you do the same thing for two years, it's it's time to uh to move on a little bit. 
Sure. Was was uh, Robichon still alive when you were working there? He he was. I had never uh, I never met him. We had a thing called Robichon Week, and and all the corporate chefs would come down, and and check if everything was fine. But he never came down while I was there. But um, mm. I do remember when he passed. It was a it was a eerie eerie setting in the kitchen. So um, I'm sure. But. So where did you go from there? So I left. Um, it's funny because one of my teachers in the French pastry school, he ended up moving to Boston and he's he opened up the Encore Boston Harbor Hotel. So I saw that he was opening it and um, and I started talking to him and he pretty much offered me a job in Boston. And obviously that's a big move, but I ended up doing it. So I moved from Vegas all the way to Boston um, to open this hotel with him. Um, so I was the chocolatier. I did all of the chocolate work, show pieces, um, candies, chocolates, anything like that. Um, which, you know, my dad's from Boston. So it was, I have a lot of family there and, and it was kind of cool to go back and see, you know, where he grew up and all of that stuff. And, um, but that was, I was there for less than a year before I decided to come back to, to Vegas. Gee, you just was, didn't like Boston or? It was, a. Uh, there was some 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 stuff happening in life and and fortunately it was right before covid hit so yeah. i got back to vegas kind of in the perfect time because um covid hit and there was a lot of layoffs and you know yeah i feel like it wouldn't have been a great situation if i would have stayed much longer so you know everything happens for a reason so i'm glad that i came back in time and are you are you still here in vegas or or are you in california now i'm in vegas yeah. So uh, how did you get to Tao, Tao Group? And also, I mean, t when I th first heard Tao Group, my initial reaction was I, I thought that's a nightclub and I wouldn't yeah. think you'd be eating pastry in a nightclub. But uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, Tao, we have nightclubs. Um, we have about 80 locations globally. Oh, wow. Um, so that's restaurants, nightclubs, bars, uh, speakeasies, you know, you name it. Tao's, Tao has something in there, um, a ton of different brands. So um, when I first started, um, Hakkasan and Tao were different um, companies. So they actually merged, which is why they brought me on to help manage the West Coast. Yeah. And does that mean... When you're so West Coast covers what? How many properties? So I have about eleven restaurants that I kind of oversee pastry and menu changes and training staff. Um, but I've been lucky enough to work on a lot of projects globally. So menu development for new restaurants in Dubai and Mexico and Turkey wow. and um, you know we have restaurants all over the world. So um, my chef. Um, he lets me kind of be on those projects and work on new desserts. So it's been, it's been a really fulfilling, really a creative space for me. So um, it's been great. Oh, that's, that's excellent. So you still get to, to cook. Yeah, no, I'm in the kitchen every, every day. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, when you think corporate chef, it's, you know, more computer work and stuff like that, but yeah. Management uh, of other chefs. And yeah. So there's definitely that, but no, I'm in the, the kitchen every day. I'm helping in, you know, with big parties and um, going in and teaching new desserts. So I think I would be very bored if I was at a computer all day. I don't know if that's for me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So what's the, uh, what's the ultimate goal? Where, where do you want to end up eventually? Um, you know, I, I always had a dream to open up my own bakery and, uh, and now being in the profession, I have friends who have opened them up and, and heard so, so things about it. It's, it's a brutal <laughs> business, you know, it's like, uh, you're there all day long, your, your family's there all day long. So, um, you know, I think, I think being able to travel the world and, and sharing, you know, what I like to do, teaching classes, I think that's the ultimate goal. Huh. Um, because the people, the chefs that I look up to, that's, that's kind of what they're doing. They're traveling around and they're teaching their desserts in different countries and getting to uh, experience that. And I think that's the ultimate goal. So I have a, a lot of work to get there, but, um, 
I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. Well, um, okay. Yeah. This has been uh, great. I appreciate you doing it. And, and I just want to say, um, to the listeners that, uh, they should look at your Instagram page because your, your desserts are really works of art. They Thank are, so they are amazing to look at. Uh, I'm assuming that they're, that they taste great, but, um, uh, it's something, yeah. uh, it's something just kind of through Instagram that, you know, I took a lot of time in the pictures. I got like a nice camera and, uh, and you would come in on like, um, on my day off, my wife would find me just on the floor, like taking, uh, hundreds of pictures of a random dessert, you know, with different lighting. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of what social media is, but it, um, having that portfolio has, has really helped me. And it's like, uh, you know, when you're, look, when you're going for a job and you can send someone there and give them kind of an idea of what, what you like to do, it's, it's helped me a lot. So, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, the and, and what is your, uh, Instagram? It's going to be a uh, F O R T E N J. So it's my last name and my initials. Okay. Um, F O R T E N J. And I will put a link to that. Uh, in the show notes for the episode. So okay, perfect. Uh, one that. last, well, uh, two last things. One, uh, what's the best restaurant in Las Vegas currently? So, not only because I work out of this kitchen every morning, but I would definitely recommend Hakkasan in Las Vegas. It's in the MGM Grand, um, really high end Chinese food, uh, but we have a, a great pastry program. So if you wanted to experience some of the uh, more intricate, fun desserts that that you kind of see. Um, I would definitely recommend Hakkasan. But, uh, but it's funny. Um, I, it, that just reminds me that I saw um, David Chang. For people who don't know, is a a big chef. But he cur- he said currently the best Chinese food in the United States is Las Vegas. <laughs> Which yeah. I, you know, I'm sure New York and San Francisco are you know. Uh, up in arms about him saying that, but um, <laughs> but there is tremendous Chinese food here in Las Vegas right now. So yeah, I mean, especially with Hakkasan, we have I think we have twelve Hakkasans globally. Um, and when you when you look at London, we have Michelin stars for our Hakkasan. Um, it's a really high end restaurant, and um, they, we take it very serious over there. So even with you know Chinese food, or if you are going specifically for the desserts, I would recommend that restaurant for yeah. sure. Cool. And the other thing that just came to mind was I'm I'm sure you watched the show The Bear. Mm-hmm. I've seen and, a, I've seen it some snips. Yeah. Oh, you haven't watched the whole thing? Oh, because no. there there's a guy. The pastry uh, <clears throat> the pastry chef in the restaurant is uh, uh, well trying to become the pastry chef. Anyway, um, and it's in Chicago, and <laughs> I don't know most restaurant people. I think like that show. So I just I know that there's it. a that there's a lot of yelling, is what I've seen, um, which true. is slightly true, but um, not so much well, in but pastry. But also remember, this is a, like a family restaurant where, you know, it's a family that doesn't get along all that great, but clearly yeah. loves each other. So <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, definitely. again, uh, thank you for doing this, Nick, and I will uh, put up that link to your Instagram in the show notes and. That'll be it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely.